Hello, this is Mark Unka for Executive Director of uh, the Fiber Optic Sensing Association and welcome to our March webinar, uh, Fiber Optic Sensing in City Power Networks. Um, we are going to have a slightly different uh, uh, approach this time. This time we're able to show a case study involving a customer, uh, but leading off uh, the webinar presentation will be uh, Doug Norton, uh, currently Vice President of Engineering of Fiber Optic Pipeline Solutions, and uh, he will provide the, some of the technical background, but he will be joined by Ken Jenkins, who is an engineer who's been involved with the project for Indianapolis Power and Light. And uh, we're really privileged that this particular uh, installation um, has been recognized uh, by the uh, Edison Institute uh, as one of the finalists uh, for one of its leading technology projects. So we'll hear more about that, but it is something that has very much been uh, uh, acknowledged as being state of the art. So Doug, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And uh, as as I begin here, I would like to just uh, state that um, <clears throat> FIOPS, Fiber Optic Pipeline Solutions, we were formed in 2014 uh, by NKT, now under NKT Photonics. And our mission, uh, we are not an equipment provider uh, or manufacturer, but our mission is to provide distributed fiber optic sensing solutions, initially to pipeline monitoring applications, but uh, more recently we've diversified into the utility world, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so uh, just a little more about uh, how we came involved with uh, Ken at IPL. Um, we were introduced through uh, one of IPL's cable suppliers, which was AFL, and AFL was aware of what FIOPS's capabilities were in providing distributed sensing solutions. So uh, FIOPS came to IPL and provided a presentation and demonstration of the distributed temperature sensing technology which is what we will, uh, which was what Ken will be discussing first in the case study, and it's been successfully implemented in their uh, underground secondary power networks to monitor the power lines, uh, primarily where they're co-located near steam lines. So that's that's how we got involved. And so right now, I want to turn things over to Ken Jenkins and let him begin. I, uh, I, first of all, I just want to say I'm really excited and it's an honor to present to you. Um, I really think FIOPS and IPL are on to something that I think can be used in most of the utility industry, whether they have a steam distribution line like we have uh, that we coexist with. Um, you know, th these are some exciting and challenging times for the electric uh, utility industry. Um, you know, with all the new technology coming out, generally utilities are very slow to adapt to new technologies. We, you know, we, we have equipment out in our network that's 40 to 80 years old, you know, and the technology really hasn't changed since, you know, the, you know, when we start electrifying cities and stuff. And now we're seeing all this great new technology, but yet we still kind of have a mindset of you know, going at a turtle's pace with this. And so you got to be very selective surgically about which technologies you jump on because you don't want to jump on one and then it gets outdated and replaced with something else and you've invested all this money and, you know, and that cost gets translated over to the customer. Um, one of the challenges I see in the future for the utility industry is microgrids. I envision probably in about 20 years, you could probably go to your local big box hardware store and pick up your own uh, generating unit for your personal use, and then your neighborhood would be interconnected. And I, you know, all of us kind of see is we're we're going to need to change and become almost like a middleman, like an inter interconnect all these neighborhoods and all these little microgrids and be less of a generator. So it's really shaking up our industry. And if we don't adapt, you know, I could see us going out like the newspaper industry. You know, an example I like to share is, you know, the difference between Sears and Amazon. Sears used to have a really robust um, distribution system and they could have been the next Amazon, but they didn't see it coming. 
they didn't adapt with the change and now they're a dinosaur and they're going extinct. Um, so with this presentation, I'm gonna give you a little background on Indy and why it's an important city uh, for our country and you know, and the local economic impact. You know, just a little fun facts about Indy that most people probably wouldn't recognize. You know, Indiana's a flyover state. You know, Indianapolis is a very small town, in my opinion. I liken it to the world's small or the world's largest small town. Um, and uh, you know, and then I'll go into kind of like what led us into where we are today, some of the issues, and then how fiber optic sensing is helping us provide an even more reliable system. So on this slide, here's a little statistic about our uh, system. Um, as you can see, it serves um, 2,600 customers, it has 72 uh, miles of primary cable, 37, a little over 37 miles of secondary cable, a little over 1,200 manholes, and then we have 140 network vaults, and within those network vaults is roughly about 315 network transformers. That's changed a little bit since I've done this graphic, but it hits the point. We have a small to medium-sized network. Con Ed in New York has uh, just a tremendous size. I mean, they, they just dwarf us. They're the largest in our industry. And usually when Con Ed does something, all the other utilities with networks kind of follow. And so this technology, Con Ed hasn't uh, used. So it's kind of cool for once being the ones kind of leading the way. And with this slide, uh, the most important uh, figure on here to me is those 2,600 customers. And with IPL's overall service territory, that 2,600 customers really isn't that much. And as you can see, it only accounts for 3.6% of our load. And this network is within a mile square of our downtown area. Um, but, you, you know, you got to kind of think what Indianapolis represents, you know, it's one of the amateur sports capitals of the world. And plus we have the Indianapolis 500 that draws anywhere between two to 400,000 people for, you know, about half a month. And, um, you know, so a lot of economic impact. There's, um, you know, we've hosted the Super Bowl, all the NCAA championships, final four tournaments. You know, there, there's just a lot going on in Indianapolis. And another thing about Indianapolis, uh, we have large conventions here all the time. It seems like every week there's a convention going on. And the reason why we have such a robust convention uh, industry is uh, Indianapolis is within a day's drive of 70% of the United States population. You know, we're small, we're centrally located. All the activities that a visitor would want to do is pretty much centrally located, and it's easy to navigate around as opposed to a larger metropolitan area. Um, and in fact, uh, the economic impact of the, um, of the, um, you know, the, all the visitors we get is about 28 million visitors a year with a four and a half billion total economic impact each year. So it's very important that Indianapolis Power and Light provides safe, reliable energy because I look at those 2,600 customers are actually 28 million visitors that come down to our um, you know, to visit us and there are 28 million temporary customers and it'd be really uh, terrible if we started having a lot of power outages, it would definitely affect our conventions uh, industry. So on this next slide, I'm gonna kind of give you an idea kind of what, you know, what a uh, underground secondary network is comprised of. So after the transmission lines, it comes into the substation in the bottom left corner. And then from the substation, it feeds 13.2 kilovolt primary feeders that go into underground vaults. Within these vaults are uh, submersible underground transformers. And on the low side, the 12208 side or uh, 277480 side of the network, or the network transformer is the network protector. And you can kind of think of it as a traffic cop. It's monitoring the flow of energy and uh, it will open up if it sees current starting to flow back towards the substation. And then these vaults are all interconnected on the secondary side, the 12208 side of the transformer through secondary ties, which then go off and feed individual customers. And uh, there are two types of, um, networks, um, spot network and grid network. Um, 
a grid network is multiple vaults that are interconnected and connect multiple um, customers and buildings and load. A spot network is a dedicated vault for a single customer. And at Indianapolis Power and Light, generally that's going to be our 277-480 customer. 277-480 uh, arc flash wise is uh, very dangerous. So we like to contain that uh, as much as possible. Um, it's just the inherent uh, nature of that voltage. But the 12208 is usually used in our grid network. And there's several vaults tied together feeding customers. Here's another view of a one line of that system, a very simplified system. So at the top of it is our substation. And then the little squares are the uh, breakers at the sub that can open up when it detects a fault. And then I've highlighted one of the transformers and the network protectors in this one line. And there are six total. And then in the center of that box is the secondary network connecting to the load or customers. So the way the secondary network works during a fault situation is if there's a fault on the 13.2 kilovolt side, the high side of the transformer, basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna get current flowing from the substation, but also all the transformers of this network are gonna start contributing um, current or load to that same fault through the secondary network and through the two uh, transformers on the right side. So what will happen is, is the network protector will see the fault and the current coming, you know, basically going the wrong direction in the two transformers on the right. Both of those network protectors will open and then the breaker at the sub will open and then the fault's cleared. And then our guys can safely go out, locate the fault and fix it. However, on the uh, secondary side, if you have a fault in this area, the, the breaker at the sub is not going to open the network protectors are happy because it's seeing, you know, the currents flowing in the right direction. And so what it happens is, is it treats this fault as a load. And, and the, the system is more than happy to keep feeding this load. And that's what causes the fires and stuff that you see in our network, which I'll show you some examples of. So th this first video is just some news clips of some of the uh, stuff that happened to us a few years ago. And then at the very end is a clip of something that happened in uh, Buffalo, New York. But it gives you a good example of the kind of faults that can be problematic for us. Elements tonight, there is new insight into what led to the underground explosions in downtown Indianapolis. Following breaking news from downtown as crews are investigating what caused a small fire under one of the busiest streets. IPL officials tell us a primary oil chamber failed and flames broke out in a utility vault in the 400 block of Mass Ave just before Focused 9 o'clock. On that underground fire, which sparked manhole explosions downtown, power outages, and some major traffic backups yesterday. Today, state regulators are stepping in, holding an emergency meeting to get to the bottom. Decision to open a formal investigation into IPL's underground system failures is very, very unusual. We were uh, have pretty much evacuating the building. We were waiting for the children to finish the evacuation. Watch yourself, watch yourself. Heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up! Heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up, heads up!
Okay, uh, basically um, that um, Buffalo event, that, that manhole cover weighs about 300 pounds and it went about 10 to 12 stories in the air. Um, so you see a lot of the pressure that can be built up to launch these manhole covers. And what you're seeing here is our March 19th event that was captured live on the news. Uh, we had the event, the news was reporting it during the morning rush hour. And um, this was happening as the helicopters were flying over and it happened to go over the live news. Very embarrassing. Fortunately, with all our uh, incidents, no injuries, you know, so that, that's the main important part is there were no injuries. And, you know, we constantly are striving to make the system better. Um, but, you know, there, there are times where, you know, you have to be more proactive. During that, um, that event, you know, the, we were going through a rate case that was only about two months old and it usually takes a good year and a lot of years of work to prep for a rate case. And after that incident, they, um, the IURC, who's our regulatory board, called our senior leadership in for a meeting, and it was a two-minute meeting. And in that meeting, they said that we're stopping your rate case and launching a formal investigation into your system. It, you know, is a very invasive, thorough investigation, but we are completely o an open book to them. We were very forthcoming with them and the end result was both parties were pleased with the results um, and then the rate case was continued alongside the investigation and the formal hearing. In the end, it, both parties were uh, happy with the situation uh, and, it, you know, the steps that we started making to improve the system. And what, what you're seeing here is some cable that was taken out of the, uh, the area where you saw the, uh, the screenshot of the news helicopter footage. And if you notice the top part of this cable, you can see what steam damage has done to the cable. And in Indianapolis, we have the second largest steam distribution system in the country next to, I believe, New York. And I don't know how that's quantified, but that's the statistic I've been given. And, um, but in essence, the steam is one of our big enemies. In fact, our two biggest enemies is road salt and steam. And if you zoom in closer to this cable, it'll show that this cable was manufactured in uh, 2013 and this cable was removed March, 2015. So at best, this was just a couple years old. Normally our cable lasts about 30 to 40 years before you need to replace it. So it greatly reduced the life of this cable. And in this area, there was a steam distribution line that ran perpendicular to the, the this line and right where the steam damage was is where the steam uh, distribution line was. They had abandoned it in 2014. And if you go to Google Street Maps in this area, you can see them abandoning the steam line. But this area was right above the steam. So it shows how bad the steam is for our system. And at one time, IPL did own the steam system. So it, there's a lot of areas where we're in close proximity to steam you know, through our ancestors or our forefathers putting the stuff in and, uh, you know, maybe doing it on the cheap and running it in the same trench or near each other. But we sold the steam system in uh, 20, about two, uh, year 2000 is when we sold the steam company. Okay, and then the, on the next slide is another example of um, some steam damage to our conduit system. As you can see, um, th this is what we call the Orangeburg pipe or fiber duct. And basically the steam in this area, you rendered this uh, duct line completely useless. You can see it all blistered and bubbled up. We might be able to get a small fiber optic cable through there, but I wouldn't risk doing it. And if you were to try to pull even a small electrical line in there, chances are the jacket's gonna get damaged. So th these types of, um, events led us to start trying to be more proactive. And that's one of the things the IURC criticized us on is being proactive. And so we had to really step up and start going in a more proactive uh, direction. And we first started thinking, okay, we know steam through our root cause analysis is one of our big issues. How do we monitor the steam and be able to proactively address the issues as they happen? 
and one of the ideas was to install some sensors in each manhole, all 1,200 of them, that would detect it. And, you know, that became very impractical because we'd have to figure out how to get those sensors communicating back to our control center. How is it going to alert us? And then we'd have to maintain all those sensors. So through, um, you know, we realized that there wasn't really an answer in our industry. So we decided to step out of our industry. And that's when we got in contact with FIOPS and decided to go the DTS route. And what the DTS unit allows us to do is install a large linear sensor, as you all know, um, and eliminate the need for all the um, sensors and the maintenance and the installation and the upkeep. And this is a, a snapshot of one of our routes. I believe it's our route two. And you can see the wide varying temperatures along this route. It's They're all over the place. And those two spikes, uh, were addressed and taken care of. And the reason why you're seeing the mirrored spikes is because the cable goes in the manhole and then comes right back through it. So you're seeing a, a double image or a mirror image of that. But there was a steam issue there. We contacted the steam company and they were able to rectify it. Now it's around about 95 degrees ambient temperature in that manhole. But we have about, I would say about 11 kilometers installed thus far, about 36,000 feet. And to get the same level of resolution that the DTS provides, if we were to use sensors, you know, we'd have to install 11, about 11,000 um, sensors along this route and maintain them, which would be impractical. So we're very pleased with the DTS system and the level of resolution it gives us and the fact that it's, you know, uh, taking a sample about every minute and a half. So we got up to date uh, information. On this next slide, we have um, another view of one of our routes, and this is our enhanced view, and this was taken during our pilot uh, run. And if we zoom in closer on this pilot run, you'll see um, a hot spot that was detected by the uh, DTS during the first weeks of the pilot. And what, what we have here is you've got the steam line that's red, and then the S with the circle is a steam manhole cover. And usually when you see this concentrated of a high hot spot, that means that there's a perpendicular line running across our uh, duct bank. But as you see, there's no steam line. So we had to dig through our old records and we realized when they redid this area of the city, there was a service line going into the building that used to be there. Well, when it was retired, it wasn't retired properly. So there was a steam leak over by the manhole, the steam manhole. And then it found the easiest path, which was that pipe running to where the building used to be, which was right underneath our line. And here's the temperature trace of that, um, that event. And so we installed the pilot route in late June of 2016. And as you can see on this chart on July 4th, the peak temperature you know, was around 114 degrees on that second little hump there. But as you can see, the hump on the left actually started rising a lot more. And then by July 30th, which is the red line, it was about 138 degrees Fahrenheit. And so when we saw this, you know, we were able to get with the uh, the steam company and say, hey, that there's a, you know, a, you, you got a steam issue about 60 feet south of our manhole and they were able to dig it up and sure enough they found that abandoned line they were able to retire it properly and also fix the issue in their steam manhole and you, you know we were able to correct this before it started doing damage to our conduit and to our cable to replace the conduit in an area it cost us about two to three hundred dollars a foot in downtown indy to replace the conduit and this was a about a 250 foot run of conduit. So if we would have lost this, it would have been a, you know, we probably wouldn't have known it had collapsed and uh, deformed. And then we would have, if we had an emergency where we need to replace a feeder, we would have to dig up the street and it would take us a long time to restore power on that feeder. And we wouldn't be running at ideal conditions with our uh, resiliency that we normally like to have. On this next slide, it's another example of what the steam does to us. And this is also along our um, pilot route. And as you can see, there's a hot spot there. And if you notice the little orange area in this area, 
if we go to the next slide, once we open or had the steam company open up the ground, you'll see what that orange area was. As you can see, the outer pipe has been completely degraded. The insulation between the outer pipe and the actual steam line is completely gone. And if you look on the right hand side of the picture, right above the steam line, you can see our gray PVC conduit for our duct bank. They, they damaged the outer uh, concrete and casing when they were opening this up. But you can see how close our duct bank is to the steam line. And um, the issue with the steam, not only de degrading our cable, it derates it. And as you can see, this is a, a quick and dirty uh, calculation using SimCap. Um, to uh, kind of see what how much uh, amperage we can actually use on our cable. And this particular cable in this duct package is uh, normally rated for about 320 amps before you start derating it. And what happens is basically you're voiding the manufacturer warranty because now you're operating out of spec. If you run too much current through, it creates too much heat, and then you start damaging the jacket from within. And with that external heat source as the steam line, it starts derating how much power you can actually utilize on that cable. And as you can see, instead of 320 amps, with this rough calculation, you know, we can only probably squeeze about 295 amps through it. If that cable was moved and, and was in the closest duct to it, now you can see the difference with that external heat. Now we're only down to 200 and 50 amps that we can actually use you know so we're losing the efficiency of the cable before we actually start doing damage ourselves luckily in our system our secondaries normally don't see that kind of amperage so we really were you know we wouldn't approach that in normal conditions but if we had a couple feeders out and that secondary tie is helping backing up other transformers that might be down then you would see this in rare cases where we would be approaching that uh, rating limit on this next slide is a video that was taken in late June of 2017. And in this video, pl please uh, pay special attention to the upper left corner. What you're seeing is some smoke coming out of one of our underground vaults that has a transformer and protector. And right next to it, you can see a little puff of smoke. And that's a manhole. And here in a few seconds, once the video starts playing, you'll see the manhole cover lift up. And it's one of our other things that we're being proactive about. As you see, the manhole cover stayed in place because it's a locking manhole cover. Now you see a car come by. And next you'll see a, the, another uh, puff of smoke come out of the manhole. But the one thing I really want to point out is that car. That car, that person in that car potentially could not, you know, may not have went home that night. They would have either been in the hospital or more likely they would have been killed if it hadn't been for that locking manhole cover. Um, this is another thing that we decided to do after that news footage that you saw is all our covers downtown are now lockable. They'll raise up about two inches and come back down. And, you know, we, we've had them operate and this is the first time we've had them operate on camera. So, you know, it's a proof that this system works. And in my opinion, it potentially saved this person's life. So it's very important that we really make sure, you know, the technology we buy into helps, you know, provide that safe, reliable power that we're striving for. And in this incident, we also had the DTS system in this manhole. And you can see at 1257, the ambient temperature was 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then by a 105 p.m., it jumped to 330 degrees Fahrenheit at the peak. And by that time we were starting to arrive on scene and starting to cut away the secondary to isolate the fault. That, that first puff of smoke you saw happened a couple minutes before that, the 105 mark. Um, and, and the sampling rate of this was about a minute and a half, you know, that we have on this. So, you know, it's a really good proof of concept. It showed that we could detect the fire and hopefully with some more, um, you know, thorough investigation, maybe we can start predicting when these are going to happen and stop it before it becomes an event is our hope. So the next aspect of the presentation is about the distributive acoustic sensing. 
And with our system, it utilizes the same fiber optic cable as the DTS. The DTS uh, fiber optic cable that we installed had is both multi-mode and single mode. And since the DAS is single mode and the uh, DTS is multi-mode, we decided to go with a hybrid cable. And plus, we also can use the single mode for our network SCADA that helps us uh, control the network protectors in our downtown area. And it also provides us valuable information how the system's running. The hope with the distributed acoustic sensing is to detect physical damage to our ducts, manholes, and vaults. We've had uh, other contractors working for the comm industry dig into our duct banks, our manholes, and then they'll cover it up quickly. And we find out years later when we have an emergency or we're doing our manhole inspections that somebody has compromised our infrastructure. This way, you know, the DAS will be able to tell us, hey, somebody's digging near you. Go out there and check and make sure everybody's safe. Make them aware that they're near our power lines and you know just make everybody more safe and we can avoid this physical damage. Another uh, positive or another aspect or that for the di distributive acoustic sensing is to detect primary faults. And how we detect primary faults on our system, since it's all underground, it's hard to see where the fault's at. And on the primary side, it doesn't have the, the fires that you've seen. They, you know, with the protection at the sub and the network protector, it faults and then it's over within milliseconds. So how we find those faults is the guys will go to the substation, hook up to the affected cable, and they'll start thumping. And thumping is where you're applying a high voltage, about 10,000 volts. And what it allows it to do is jump or bridge across that break in the cable. And it sounds either like a firecracker going off or sometimes it'll sound like a shotgun blast. So then our guys would travel the city going along the route of that thump. And based on what the breaker at the substation is telling us, sometimes they can give you a good reading on the footage. But once the feeder starts splitting off and going multiple directions, it's anybody's guess. And usually it's in the tail end of it. But it might take our guys a day, half a day if they're lucky, to find where the fault's at. And what they do is they go to key manholes, lifting up the covers, listening for that sound. Sometimes they just got to trust their gut instinct and, you know, their intuition where it's at. But the problem with thumping is it's like hitting our cable with lightning. And every time you thump, it degrades the cable. So the thumper will usually thump about once every seven to 10 seconds. So each time you're degrading the cable further and you're potentially creating future problems that may occur in a week. It may occur a year from now. So it's important to reduce the amount of thumping and that's what we're gonna use the distributed acoustic sensing for as its primary purpose. And then the last part is we're, we're hoping to, uh, you know, detect secondary faults. And I can get in that later if anybody's interested. So this first uh, video I, we're going to show you is during our pilot of the DAS. And basically we had somebody stand about 250 meters away from where we were set up in the substation. And what you're going to hear is uh, him taking a hammer and hitting the cover of the manhole cover just so we could see if it could detect the sound. So you'll hear three, um, three um, hits on the manhole cover, then a pause, three more hits. And you want to pay attention right in dead center, those three longer lines. That's him hitting the uh, manhole cover. So if we go ahead and play it, Okay, so, so that, that was simulating the hammer being hit. And before I show you the next um, example, a case study that we did on the pilot, I want to show you an example of what thumping actually looks like. So this is something I took at a, a latter date at a different area of our network. And if we go ahead and play the video, I can, um, you know, you can get a good idea what the thumping sounds like.
Okay, th this is on our um, pilot DAS that we did. And if you look at the left-hand side of the uh, screen, you'll see that the map is just kind of centered on just a generic location along the route. And then on the right-hand side, you'll have uh, basically the kind of what we call the waterfall, the, what, it's, what it's hearing. And over around the 270 mark, you'll start to see the thump coming in. And uh, you won't really hear the thump for about 13 seconds because right now we're demonstrating that it's on a separate channel, not the channel where we know the thump will occur. And what you'll see on the left-hand side is the map will jump to the location. And then on the right-hand side, the, uh, the waterfall will uh, go to the correct channel automatically. And it'll start, then you'll start hearing the thumping about 13 seconds in. And I apologize for the background noise on the video, uh, it, it was uh, the noise from the control house at the substation that you'll be hearing mostly. Another great aspect about the DAS system is for our crew leaders who are thumping at the time, all they get is an email alert and which pops up on their phone and with a Google link, you click on that link and it shows you approximately where that thump is. So they can thump the cable about 10 times. They get the email alert. They send some guys to that location, maybe open up a couple manholes in that general location, thump one or more two more times and they found the location instead of you know thumping it for half a day to a day. So we're greatly reducing the chances of us further damaging that cable. Plus we're saving a ton of money on labor. Um, you know, a lot of times this happens in the wee hours of the night or on the weekend. So you know you got a lot of double overtime charges. And plus another thing is is that the guys work late at night, they're not here the next day to work on customer projects and stuff, routine stuff that they need to work on. So it definitely puts a strain on our resources. <clears throat> and with that, um, you know, I'm open to, Doug and I are open for questions and, you know, concerns and all that. Thank you very much, Ken, and, and actually Doug as well uh, for a very informative presentation. You know, I was thinking as you were, uh, first of all, I should I should note that uh, some of the videos uh, did not come through, at least the sound didn't come through. So okay. we, will, we will, which is fine, we'll, we'll try and address that for the um, uh, the YouTube video as it when it gets posted. So we'll probably do a little uh, back editing in order to uh, uh, capture that. Um, I, I confess, Ken, I've learned a new word today, which is thumping. Um, yeah. And it sounds like it must be a very labor intensive process. So have you qu tried to quantify the savings you have of being able to do this in a more automated, uh, clearly it's safer, but also the, the uh, savings associated with being able to do it uh, uh, using um, uh, fiber optic sensing? Y yes, um, b basically, uh, you know, like we have our guys work overnight, they're on time and a half during a regular business day. And, you know, usually it's all hands on deck and a normal three man crew, you know, usually cost about for an all night, probably about six, seven thousand um, dollars. When you got all hands on deck, now you're probably talking, you know, 25, 30 some thousand dollars per incident. You know, just it's very labor intensive. It strains our guys. Um, but, you know, usually when we have an issue, even if it's a primary fault where the public's not even aware of it, there was no fire you know, we like to get that installed because now our, our redundancy in our system has been affected, you know, and we want to get that up as soon as possible, even though the customer doesn't even know anything's going on. That's the beauty of the uh, 
the secondary grid network is we, we have customers that have never even seen their lights flicker. Um, but when it goes out, it's really noticeable. There's a lot of political ramifications. Um, you don't get the little, um, you know, brownouts or uh, flickers or momentary outages like you do in the regular distribution system when like a animal gets in the line or a limb lands on it. So, yeah, but it, it is very, very labor intensive. And plus, you know, the guys are lifting in these heavy manhole covers. So there's probably an intangible part where you're saving their backs, you know, in future health problems. You know, if, the, the, if we can minimize how many of those things they have to lift up and pull off. And since they're the locking covers, they're, they're a lot more cumbersome to get off because they got to lift past the locking mechanism and pull it back. They're just not a simple manhole cover you can kind of lift up and slide off. So, it, you know, there, there's definitely, definitely economic benefits for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, you kind of mentioned that you guys are state of the art in terms of getting ahead of, of the curve with uh, some of the other uh, utilities. Um, obviously, you've also though, been um, platformed or highlighted by uh, the uh, Trade Association, the Edison Institute. Have mm -hmm. you had conversations with some other utilities that have expressed it in interest in this solution? And if so, which ones? Uh, PG&E. Uh, was interested. I gave this presentation at the Eaton ENSC -E conference, and for the network industry, the secondary network industry, you know, it's probably the premier um, conference to go to. You know, a lot of um, experts there, a lot of sharing of knowledge, and um, so I've given the presentation there, and I've had several. Um, utilities come up to me wanting further information, you know, wanted the, you know, all the specifics, and I'm more than happy to share all that I know about it. Um, I've also given a presentation at Con Ed, uh, Seagree conferences, um, you know, so I've done this several places, and it seems like the utility industry, the electrical utility industry is interested, and even though they might not have steam issues you know the DAS might work for them or they can use the DTS for other other applications so I'm just trying to get the word out that hey this is a cool exciting technology that we need to apply but unfortunately like I've stated you know the electric utility is a very conservative uh, industry and we sometimes move a little bit slower than I would like at adopting new technologies but you know since you're dealing with you know in the end, the customer, it goes towards the customer's rate. You have to be responsible of that and not, you know, wasting money. You have to be very surgical and very precise at what technologies you implement. Now, uh, <clears throat> Ken, uh, maybe you could elaborate on this. I think you've touched on it a little bit. In, in a number of the conduits um, that you are sharing, uh, there may already be fiber optic cable. Uh, to what extent can that that existing fiber optic cable be utilized for the solution? Um, we, we really don't share our con conduits with other utilities. So, okay. you know, but, but it's our own fiber that we're using and installing. Um, you know, not, not a lot of people, you know, the comm industry, you know, they don't really get into our manholes unless it's an extreme rare case that they absolutely need to get in there. But we really try not to share it just because the inherent danger with the, um, you know, the electrical system and them not being trained to be in there. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, all this fiber that we're putting in, you know, serves multiple purposes. You know, our SCADA, DTS, DAS, and anything future that comes along that we could utilize it for. You know, we, we have multiple pairs of both multi-mode and single mode. Um, you know, we, we do route the cable to where it, you know, up around the top of the manholes. You know, unfortunately that, you know, it gives us good early warning that, hey, heat's building up because heat rises, but it also makes it susceptible to be getting burned. But we're implementing MPLS technology to where we'll have multiple ways for the SCADA to communicate. So if there's a burn or break in the cable, it has multiple choices to get back to our control center. So we can suffer a few breaks before it becomes detrimental to our control system. Sure. And let me ask you, um, are you permanently monitoring with DAS or do you plan to use this on a case-by-case -case basis to determine the location of a fault? 
Uh, with, with the DAS, um, we just went into the second phase of our pilot program, and it was just installed a couple weeks ago. Uh, initially, our DAS system, the pilot was uh, uh, late last summer, and then we finally got to go ahead to go further into the second stage of the pilot program. And so right now, it's monitoring just one of the DTS lines. And, we're, and then later on this year, I'll be installing uh, an actual dedicated DAS uh, loop that will also serve as our SCADA backbone. But right sure. now, right now it, we're just uh, detecting uh, physical damage and thumps. And the thumps will be on a need basis. Basically, the guys out that actually do the work out in the field, they know if there's a fault on certain feeders that the DAS is covering part of it. So then they'll know to if they get an alert what it's for, and they can go to it. And actually, you may want to help uh, it just explain the different parts of uh, DTS and DAS systems that you're using, uh, such as uh, spectrometer and the device that you're using to send the signal. So you may want to just kind of clarify the distinction between those. Okay, I uh, Doug might be able to elaborate a little bit more on the technical side of it. Yeah. Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Mark? Yes, go ahead. Um, so the, the question was, what is the difference between the, the technology you're talking about and the DAS and the DTS? Yes, and how, you, how you're using it. Well, yeah, I mean, basically, as Ken showed, that the DTS is monitoring the temperature using a Raman backscatter over a multimode fiber. As you mentioned, the cable has both single and multimode, and that uh, DTS system is measuring the temperature events predominantly driven as Ken suspects from the steam lines and that lets them gives them alerts uh, they're co-located the fiber is co-located near the electrical line so if for whatever reason the electric if it gets hot near the electric line they'll know whether it's due to steam or to due to some other heat source um, so that's that's the DTS and the, and the DAS is of course the distributed acoustic using the coherent Rayleigh backscatter uh, technology to basically provide um, uh, acoustic, uh, it's an interferometric type uh, uh, effect where the pulses interfere with each other and the, the, the system demodulates that and can provide a full spectrum from DC up to potentially up to 10 kilohertz. So this will give, with a DAS system, the ability to s hear all the frequency content of faults whether they be primary or secondary faults and as well as as ken mentioned be able to detect uh, activity in vaults and manholes when maybe there shouldn't be for example if someone opens them up or breaks into them they'd be able to see that as well um, but the technology uh, again that das is using the single mode fiber again coherent really uh, backscatter system i hope that answers it that's 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 very helpful um Actually, while I while we have you, we always had you, uh, Doug, available. Uh, we talked before about in the Indianapolis installation, they don't share uh, their conduits with other utilities, so there's not going to be fiber optic cable already there. Um, are there other installations or potential installations elsewhere where the fiber might already be present? Yes, uh, again, the, the key is, is it where they need it to be? Uh, is, you know, Ken knows, for example, in Indianapolis, where the, where the primary and secondary lines are. So in, even in Indianapolis, there, there is fiber installed for other data comm purposes, but what was there wasn't in the right areas to support what he needed. So that's the big question. But in the cases where if someone uh, does an assessment and figures out, yes, there is existing cables with spare unused fibers, potentially uh, either a DTS or DAS could be connected to those spare fibers to monitor for these same types of events, whether they be thermal events or fault-related acoustic events.